You can't be successful by yourself. And with that in mind, let's talk about a few ways to build relationships. Most of these tips are for building business relationships, building contacts, building good working relationships with colleagues, with vendors, with prospects, with future clients and present clients and past clients, building relationships. But remember, we are all people, regardless of our profession. And many of these tips work well for building other relationships, too. Let's start with kindness. How kind should you be? As kind as you possibly can. Who should you be kind to? To everyone you come in contact with. From taxi drivers to hotel clerks to waitresses to store clerks to people on the street and people in your office and people at home. Be kind to everyone. And here's why. A kind word goes a long way. Somebody's having a bad day and you don't know they're having a bad day. But somebody's really feeling bad and you offer up a kind word. Maybe it's just a friendly, hello, how are you? Maybe it's just taking a minute or two to listen to what somebody has to say. But your few words of kindness or your few minutes of attention could turn somebody's day around might make them feel more worthwhile, cared for. Be generous with your kindness. It'll go a long way. People will remember, whether you know them or not. If you're in a crowded restaurant and you're especially nice to the waiter, guess what? He'll remember you next time you come in. And then guess what'll happen? You'll get even better service. When you give kindness, it's not gone. It's invested. It'll come back to you two, five, ten, a hundred times. Kindness, it's so important in every aspect of your life. It's so important in building good relationships with others. Now, here's what else is important. Sensitivity. Being touched by the experiences of others. Being sensitive to others. Understanding the plight of others. Opening up your heart and your mind and your attention to address the needs of others, the people you work with, the people you live with, putting yourself in someone else's shoes, seeing if you can what's going on in their heart. If there's a problem, you've got to be sensitive enough to ask some questions. Not one question, but many questions. Sometimes you won't even get through to the root of the problem until you've gotten two or three questions deep. Most people won't reveal the problem on the first question. You say, Mary, how are you today? How are things? And she says, well, everything's okay. And you can tell by the way she said it that everything's not okay. And most of us don't want to come right out and say what the real problem is unless two criteria are met. Number one, we're talking to someone we can trust. And number two, we're talking to someone who really cares. So sometimes it takes that second question, maybe a third and maybe a fourth, before trust builds. And the person finally understands that you do care. Then they're willing to tell you what's really going on, what's really on their mind. Gosh, that saves so much time asking questions up front. Did you ever talk for an hour and then ask a question, found out that you just wasted the previous hour? Learn to ask questions that will build the trust and communication between you and those you work with. Learn to express, not impress. If you want to touch somebody, express sincerity from the heart. Impress builds a gulf. Express builds a bridge. Identification. You want to be able to relate your thoughts and philosophies and experiences to someone who will say, Me too. I know what you mean. You don't want their reaction to be, so what? If you're meeting someone for the first time, you're simply getting acquainted, making contact. Here's where you start. Find something you have in common. Find something you can both identify with. Start with where they are before you try taking them where you want them to go. So if you're trying to talk to somebody who's been stricken in the heart 
and you've had this experience, you can talk about being stricken in the heart, and it'll mean something. It'll have substance. It'll have depth. And if you start there, and then start building the bridge, you have identification. Then you start building rapport. And when you start building a rapport with someone, or when you want to enhance the rapport you have with someone, you need effective communication skills. You'll need the skills that'll help you work better with others to achieve their goals, and achieve your goals. You need effective communication skills. Let me give you a few tips on good communication, because to be able to get along well with others, to be able to work well with others, to be able to live well with others, you must be a good communicator. Number one, have something worth saying: interest, fascination, sensitivity, and knowledge. Number two, now that you've got something worth saying, number two is say it well. And you've got to be able to translate it so it'll benefit someone. You must have a good delivery system for your substance and knowledge, and awareness and understanding and experience. Learn to say it well. And here are some clues on saying it well. Number one, sincerity. The best communication occurs when both people are sincere. One sincerely wishing to learn or listen. And the other sincerely wishing to share. Number two in saying it well is repetition. Part of saying it well is simply practicing to say it well. Practice, practice, practice. Part of what I teach in sales training is practice. Practice. You start with something simple, and when you don't know much about what you're doing, practice is even more important. Let's say you're in sales and your presentation's not that good, and you wander around saying, "You wouldn't want to buy this, would you?" I'm telling you, maybe if you say that often enough during the day, somebody might say, "Well, maybe I would." What are you selling? Now you can't say, "Mind your own business." No, once you've opened the door, you've got to go through it. Here's what happens if you practice in sales: you're bound to make sales. Somebody will say, "What are you selling?" and you've got to tell them. Maybe they'll want it. You're bound to get better if you practice. You'll get better. You'll get better at your sales presentation. You'll get better at listening to your prospect. You'll get better at closing the sale. You'll get better at earning a living. Practice is just as valuable as a sale, because here's what's valuable in sales: the skills. The sale will make you a living. The skills will make you a fortune. So practice your presentation, and your ability to communicate what you know. The people out there who say, "No, I wouldn't care for any," are just as valuable. Why? Because they took the time to let you practice your presentation, and especially when you're just getting started, you might want to pay them to listen to you practice while you stumble around. So, be thankful for the nose. Practice helps you develop skills. Skills make labor more valuable. If you just sell, you can make a living. If you skillfully sell, you can make a fortune. If you just talk, you can hold a family together. If you skillfully talk, you can build dreams and the future. The difference is skill. You can cut a tree down with a hammer. But it takes about 30 days. If you trade the hammer for an axe, you can cut the tree down in about 30 minutes. The difference between the 30 minutes and 30 days is the tool, and your best communication tool is your skill. So practice to get the skill of saying it well. Part of saying it well is sincerity. The next part is repetition. Now here's another part of saying it well: brevity. Sometimes you don't need too much, just enough. The more you know, here's what I found out: the more you know, the briefer you can be, because you can learn to make words more effective. Jesus was brief when he was putting his team together. 
He just wandered around the countryside, and every once in a while he'd see somebody he wanted on his team and said, You follow me. Now that's short. That's brief. Now why could Jesus be so brief and yet be so effective? Here's what I think. For all that he was that he didn't have to say. For all that he was that he didn't have to say. When you become bigger, when you become wiser, when you become stronger, you become a person of better reputation so that when you arrive, maybe your reputation has preceded you. And when you get there, you don't have to say much. You don't have to launch into a two-hour harangue if your reputation has preceded you. Your reputation will get a lot of the job done for you before you ever arrive. Next is style. Part of saying it well is style. Be a student of style, a variety of styles. Then make sure you develop your own. Be a student, but develop your own. Don't be someone else. Let someone else influence you, but don't become them. Develop your own style. Here's another tip on saying it well. Vocabulary. You've just got to have a good vocabulary to say it well. Vocabulary. We can only translate for other people with the tools called vocabulary. If you're lacking in vocabulary, then you're lacking in tools to describe some problem or some answer. Words, vocabulary, you can't communicate without them. And you can't communicate well without a defined vocabulary. Every time you come across a word that's new to you, what should you do? Look it up. Every time you're in a conversation and the other person uses a word that's new to you, look it up. Now, most of the time you can figure out the meaning of a new word by how it's used. But if you can't, make sure you hold your response until you know for sure. Several years ago, some of my friends took a survey among prisoners, some rehabilitation program they were working on. And they weren't looking for this, but here's what they found. There's definitely a relationship between vocabulary and behavior. Interesting. This is what they found. The more limited the vocabulary, the more the tendency to poor behavior. Wow. When you stop to think about it for a moment, it makes sense. Vocabulary is a way of seeing. It gives us insight. And only with your present vocabulary can you see. You can't use tools you don't have to see, to create light, understanding, awareness, comprehension, perception, vision. You can only have as much vision as your present vocabulary will give you. And if you're limited in vocabulary, then you can't see very well. What if a person could only see the world through a little tiny hole? Can you imagine the mistakes he'd make in judgment? He'd say, here's how it is. You'd say, no, that's not how it is. Here's how it is. The guy says, but I can't see it. How come he can't see it? He doesn't have the vocabulary to understand the translation. Now, vocabulary is also what we use as a tool to express what's going on in our heart, what's going on in our head. Translate our questions, translate our answers, our perceptions, what we see, to be able to say it. And I'm telling you, if you have a limited way of translating and expressing what's going on in your heart and what's going on in your head, you'll fall way behind. So you'd have twin problems without a good vocabulary. Number one, you wouldn't be able to see. Number two, you wouldn't be able to express. And your world would keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller not having the vision, not having the tools. Finally, you wouldn't need a place much bigger than 10 by 12 to live. Why? That's about as big as some people's world is. That's all they've got, this little narrow world, making mistakes every day. Why? They can't see. Getting it wrong every day, they can't comprehend. They can't understand, no tools with which to translate. 
For good communication, number one is having something good to say. Number two is saying it well. And number three is reading your audience. You've got to read what's going on between you and the people you're talking to. Should you say what you're saying a little softer? Should you say it a little stronger? Should you explain it more? Should you be more clear and concise? Should you quit? A lot of the decision-making that's going on during a conversation with someone depends on how well you can read, how well you can tell what's going on in the minds of those you're trying to reach. Doesn't matter if you're looking into the face of a child or the face of a colleague or a thousand faces in an audience. You've got to read what's going on. You've got to pay attention. So let me give you some ways to read. The first one is you've got to read what you see. You've got to read what you see. Search the face of a child and see if you're coming across. See if they look perplexed. See if they're getting it. See if they can't get it. Body language tells us a lot. Look at how the people you're talking to are sitting, what they are doing with their hands, their eyes. A guy's got his arms crossed, legs crossed, chin tucked down and frowning. You've got your work cut out for you. This guy's not going to be easy to reach. The lady's standing up from behind her desk. You've got to hurry. She's not going to listen to much more. You've probably got to pick up the pace and get down to it. So the first one is read what you see. Here's the second one. Read what you hear. You've got to be a good listener to be a good communicator. Get some feedback. Listen. To be a good parent, you've got to be a good listener. To talk well, you've got to listen well. That's so valuable. Get the feedback. Now what you hear may help you change gears. Be a little stronger. Be a little softer. Find a different illustration. This one isn't working. Search for another way to say it. Become sensitive to someone else's words, not just by preparing to talk when the other person's through. Listen. Pick up those signals that the feedback of words gives us. Now, here's the third way to read your audience, and that is to read how you feel. Emotional signals. You've got to learn to pick those up. Pick up those feelings. Women just seem to have this part built in. Men can learn it, but women have it. Woman says it doesn't feel right. Just doesn't feel right. Man says, what does that mean? It doesn't feel right. She says it's something. He says something, something. What is this something? She says I'm telling you something doesn't feel right. Now men can learn it, but women have it. Learn to read your emotion. Learn to read what others are feeling, so you can adjust your communication, so you can adjust your approach, so you can get your message across, so you can communicate well. 